chapter 8. Uh, Brother, Brother Zeke and I, I talked a little bit about this, I don't know, a week or two ago. And this, this has actually been on my heart for, for some time now. And Brother Jim asked me what I wanted to, what I wanted to say the title of this is. And I guess the best thing I can say is this is a check yourself message. It's about the best thing I can say it is because as I read through this scripture, man, I, I had some stuff come out at that, that just slapped me right in the mouth, just to be real honest with you. Everybody knows this story. Everybody's heard it. There's probably not been a pastor that stood on this pulpit that's not preached on it. Uh, but I think from time to time we need to go back because we get little nuggets every time we go back into a story. We're going to be starting in, in uh, John in chapter 8, and uh, I'll go ahead and start in verse 1. We're going to go through verse 11, and uh, I can tell you that God's put this on me more of a teaching than a preaching tonight. Uh, there's some, some things we're going to hit and touch on, and we may not even get all the way through it. So uh, if everybody's there, we'll go ahead and start our reading tonight. In uh, John 8, and starting in verse 1, it says, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Now here's where we're really going to get into this, okay, starting in verse 3, everybody knows the story. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What, but what sayest you? This they said, tempting him that they might have, uh, might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger rode on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and rode on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the, into the least. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself up, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I come before you tonight so humble, God, and so thankful that you've, you've called this worthlessness to the pastor or to the pulpit, God. God, I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross and let your words be taught tonight, God. I know that you've given me a conviction over this message and a, a, a feeling over this message, God, that somebody in the house tonight needs it. God, I know that I do. God, I'll pray that the word will go out and it'll touch somebody, whether it's not in the house or if it's out, out in our, our social media networks, God. I pray that it touches a soul and it can lift and help someone. Most importantly, I'm thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, for it's in his precious and holy name that I'll pray and ask all of these things. Uh, I want to start back in verse 3 right here real quick. So we see where the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and when they had set her down in his midst now i want to stop right there for just a minute do you think there's any irony in the fact that they brought a woman to jesus as i was thinking about this and and they brought him brought her to him and they said that she had been taken in adultery and then i got to thinking about the church are we the church not considered christ's bride right 
Okay, so I, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know, man, this is pointing fingers right at me. Being, being in that bride position, have I committed adultery against Christ, against my Father? I was thinking about that because, and then I started thinking about adultery. What is adultery? I know I've said it here before, and it's, it's been a while, but you know, in God's Word, He says, put, no, put no, no gods before me. Okay? So we call that idolatry, right? Okay. Well, let's look at the marriage. If you put something else or someone else before your spouse, it's considered adultery. So if we put something else or someone else above Christ, it's considered adultery. Oh, I mean idolatry. Right? Okay, that would be like, you know, some people that know me know that I really want a camper. I'd love to have a camper. But if Jeannie and I started focusing our attention on getting that camper, getting that camper, we're, we would be committing adultery against Christ because we've took our focus off and we've started praising and putting more emphasis on this than the ministry God has called us to. So I want to look at that for just, I want to just bring that out for just a second. And then they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Well, as God blessed me to study this, I wanted to think about something. It says, in the very act. In Exodus 20 and 14, it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. One for Ten Commandments, right? All right. But in Leviticus 20 and 10, this really explains that law a little bit. I'm going to use my proper Big Creek grammar, more gooder. Okay. And it says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even if, that, even if he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be, or shall surely be put to death. So let's ponder on where we're at right here. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman to Christ, caught in the very act of adultery. They're asking Christ, okay, Moses wrote the law, says that she should surely be stoned. The law says in Leviticus 20 and 10 that both the man and the woman shall surely be put to death. So I've got a couple questions for you tonight. i got a couple questions for you tonight, and I want you to think about this because to this point, I want us to, what I want tonight to be is more of a let's check where we're at spiritually. Let's check where we're at as a body of Christ. You know, we, we make a statement about we're few in numbers. But a lot of pews are empty. And now I'm not throwing rocks at nobody. I'm not throwing no stones. I'm, I just want everybody to think about this for just a moment. Why are pews empty? Just, just to, up to this point, why are our pews empty? And I'm going to say this. I'm going to say the church. It's not calling out Sydney. It's not calling out the people here in our small congregation. But I'm going to say the church as a whole. Sometimes we get a little stiff-nosed. And we look down our nose. Sometimes we play the Sadducees and Pharisees in this story. Don't we? I know I do. Sometimes we play the Sadducees and Pharisees and we try to throw people to the wolves or get stones thrown at people because they've sinned differently than we have. So all of us in here, we're all saved. We're all saved sons and daughters of the Most High God. We still stump our toe, don't we? We still sin on a daily basis. Thanks be to God. For the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary, that those sins are covered. 
So where do we have the right to get stiff-nosed and play Sadducees and Pharisees? Now, let's flip that curtain back around. This, I think this is about as much as Zeke and I talked about the other day. Have you ever been the woman? Take adultery out of the picture. Put any other sin in there that you want. If somebody tried to cast stones at you over something that you've done, I don't care how big or how little. This is about as far me and Brother Zeke got in conversation. You know, when we was talking about it, both of us just, we just looked at one another like, oh no, I've been on both sides of this. And you know, God, called, God, God led me to, to use this sermon not too long ago in another message, but he, he actually led me to preach it a little differently because, it's, well, it's what that church needed. And, and it wasn't that I, I really wanted to, but I felt like God blessed that message. Tonight, I think he just, he wants me to use this as a teaching thing and as a, hey, let's check ourselves. Let's be that light on the mountaintop. Let's check ourselves. So when I say, why are our pews empty? And I say, the church as a whole. I don't think it's necessarily our folks here that do it. Because most of our folks here are pretty humble. But I believe if we catch somebody else doing it, the person they're doing it to, I think we should witness with them. And say, hey, that's not how it is. We all fall short of the glory of God. So, and, and that's just a personal, a personal thing there that, uh, you know, we should do that. If we see somebody that's getting cast down, we need to remember that. We also need to go back and think about Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. And I, I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis of it because I'm horrible at, at memorization. But a quick synopsis of it says, it says judge, least you, judge, least you be judged in the same manner. How can you remove the beam, or how can you remove the boat out of your brother's eye when you've got a beam in your own? Well, thinking about the time of the scripture that was wrote, that beam is called a rafter. Well, back in the day that the word was wrote, that rafter was a log. So we're thinking log. Well, that moat is a speck of sawdust. So that would be like me walking up to Zeke and saying, hold still, let me get that speck of sawdust out of your eye when I've got a great big log stuck out of mine and I, I can't see nothing other than I should be looking at my own. So here's what, here's what my challenge to the church is with that piece of scripture. Let's help one another get the logs out of our eyes before we start trying to help each other get the speck of, grain, speck of dust out of our eyes. Let's get the logs out. Let's quit, let's quit uh, uh, judging one, uh, each other and let's help one another get those logs out. Let's help each other. You know, God's Word says if man gets caught, if man is in fault, caught up in fault, we should help him lift him up in prayer. That means if, if, if we stump our toe, we, we, we fall on our face. You don't put your foot on the lap of their head and shove them down that mud hole. You reach down and say, come on, brother. You just fell right in front of everybody. I fell over there behind the church. Because I guarantee you fell in mud too. Because I know I did. But going back into this law again, that was Leviticus 20 and 10 that I mentioned to you a minute ago. I want to read Deuteronomy 22, 20, 22 verses 22 through 24 to you. This is addressing the, the, the same, same thing there. So in, in verse 22 of chapter, chapter 22 in Deuteronomy, it says, If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die both the man that lie with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. If a damsel, that is a virgin, be betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city, and lie with her, then they shall bring them both unto the gate of that city. They shall stone them with stones that they die. 
the damsel because she cried not being in the city and the man because he hath uh, humbled his neighbor's wife so thou shalt put away evil from among you so quickly on that the first part of that is you know those those just committing straight up adultery and then the other one, the woman was out in the city. So what that's saying is she's out and she's kind of flaunting herself. And she's not denying anything is basically what that's saying. So we need to remember that. So in, in verse 6, it says, This they said, tempting him. I want, I want to really look at that word tempting in just a second. But this they say, tempting him, that they might have accused him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. I've got a question for you that I want you to ponder on. I know what I feel it is. What do you think Christ was writing on the ground? Word never says what it is. Zeke and I looked. <laughs> we looked. The word does not say what he wrote. I know what I feel like he wrote. So I want you to think about that for just a minute. Think about what he wrote. But they were tempting him. So basically what they were trying to do is find anything at this point to try to say that Christ was committing blasphemy. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to get him to step out and call out his deity. And he had already told them at this point who he was several times up to this point. Okay? Now, I'm going to pause right there. Ask anybody, what do you think Christ was writing on the ground? What? He's still alive at this point. I think he was the one writing on the ground. So what do you think he was writing on the ground? Anybody else? Yeah, I think he was sitting there writing. Now, I really, what difference does it make? What difference does it make that, that you guys are sitting here condemning her for the same thing that you're running around? One sin is nothing. The lying and saying is stupid. Okay. So he's sitting there writing, can I, just God, please give me the ability to not strike someone down. So let's just make a little mark in here. One sin is no different than the other okay. sin. What do you think of this? Perhaps he's writing down their sins, their iniquities. There you Maybe. That's a, that's, a good, that's a good thought. Anybody else got thought on what he might have been writing on the ground? What the law already said. What the law already said. He was probably, and, and I, I, I agree with this, and I agree with all of it, but I believe that he was writing Leviticus 20 and 10. I believe he was writing Deuteronomy 22, 22 through 24 to them. Do you really think that, Dave? Because nobody can live like that. I mean, Deuteronomy, nobody, nobody can live like that. So they can't. Christ said, so Christ said, look, we, we, you can't live that way. Right. Well, he's proven to them that, though. They didn't bring the man, too. They didn't bring the man, too. And that's what the law said to do. They was trying to get Jesus to break the law. So Jesus, and we don't know. We don't know what he said. We're just. It could have been what he was writing was the real law. Yeah. They wouldn't even do it right. Yeah. And they're the Pharisees. They're supposed to be the religious leaders. They're supposed to want us to know the law better than anybody else. I mean, not to make this drag this out or whatever. But like in Galatians, I mean, Jesus sitting right there and told us in Galatians. I mean, that's what the whole letter to the Galatian church was. Yeah. We can't be them. That's they couldn't be right. like it. Right. Well, and at this time, I think he was proving to them that they couldn't. Well, you, Jackie? I'd say anything just in my mind. I'm sitting there writing what matters. Grace. Possible. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing. That's, that's what I love about this question. That's what I love about this question. Because it could be one of those things or every one of those things that he was writing down. Actually, what Trish and J.D. just said makes more sense than any of us all said. Any, oh. any, any of us. I mean, whatever we read. And that made more sense than either. Mm -hmm. We all have the same measure of grace. It's all 
He gave us grace. It don't matter. Right. He, if he cuts your head off, he still has the same amount of grace. Right. J.D., that was one. That's what I'm saying. It could be one of those. It could be all of those. But I just, I, you know, every time that I've read this, read this story, heard this story, uh, whether I don't care which preacher preaches it, it always kind of skips over that. What, what was he writing? What was he writing? What was he writing? So I wanted to get amongst a bunch of believers and say, what do you think he was writing? Here's the thing on to me. It doesn't matter because he came out and fulfilled Everything in the Old Testament. Right. He kept so the only thing that matters is grace. Right. He kept the law perfectly. Right. Well, see, and that's that's where it goes right here. That's, that's where the, that's where it points at the end of the story. At the end of this story, it's where it points. So, and I'm not going. I'm, I'm going to try not to beat on this a whole lot. But like I said, in verse seven there. So when when they continued to ask him, he lifted himself up, and he he, he looked at him and said, "He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her." So basically, what he's saying is, "Are any of you all without sin? Are any of you all sinless?" So that's the question I ask myself. And I'm sitting here thinking, man, you know, I have been in these Sadducees and Pharisees. Let me ask you this. Uh, have you ever wondered I think it, I think they were convicted at that point. Well, I'm a woman, I've always wondered, because uh, I read this, why didn't they drag the man along with men or with the woman and that self-righteousness? Well, Zeke and I kind of had this conversation too. We kind of, and this is just us in our, our, our stupid little human mind, carnal, fleshly mind. I, I'll be honest with you. I think she, I think it was, it was a setup because they were tempting. It says he, they were tempting him. But, you know, I, I kind of think maybe that one of the, that was one of the Pharisees' women that that had been cheating with and they they just brought her there and said look we caught her in the very act of it whether they did or not they were probably lying about that too so and but that's just it that, and that's why and that's another reason i think part of what he was writing was the law telling them that hey you're supposed to bring the man and the woman where's the man but the, the, the biggest moral behind the story is they were trying to they were trying to trying to tempt christ but as far as what God put on me to bring out is, I think we need to really sit back and think and remember that we're no more self-righteous than anybody else. Or we're no more righteous than anybody else. You know, I, I, I don't have, and, and I've done it, and I'm, I'm probably one of the most guilty people in this room. I've cast a judgment on people. I cast a judgment on people because they sin a little different than I do. Personally. You know, we all, the thing is, is that all of us have our warts and our ugliness. Mm -hmm. Some are more visible than others, but we all have them. Yeah. And we should strive to live our life, and we know we fall short every day, mm -hmm. but we should strive to live our life Sergeant City Police Department, I mean, upstanding citizen of the community. And through a series of events, he got hooked on painkillers. Well, the city just throwed him out, said, look, you, you either go ahead and retire, and we'll just let this go, or we're going to fire you and make it public. But we, you know, we're, the city was trying to save face. His church put him out. Everybody around him put him out. 
we know people that something similar to this has happened to. But who lifted him up and who prayed with him? They thought, man, you're, you're, you're a preacher, you're a pastor, you're a police officer, you're a leader in this community. You know, you're just a big fake. Ain't that kind of what these Sadducees and Pharisees are doing right here? So, you know, and, and like I said, in verse 7, he's basically asking them, you know, are any of you sinless? So, I mean, he convicts them. You know, they, they, they go under conviction at that point. They, they leave. You know, I guess they start realizing at that time exactly what Paul wrote, writes later on in Romans. You know, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Mm -hmm. Whatever he judged by, he judged by. Yeah, Matthew 7. I think they're under conviction. I think that's what I'm saying. I think they're under conviction. I think they realized just that very thing right there. Whenever he said, One of you without sin, cast the first stone. So, and then, you know, then again, he stooped down, wrote on the ground, and again, we've got that question, what did he write? And then, you know, in verse 9, it does talk about them leaving, and they've been convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the eldest and going to the least. So, we know that they were convicted. God's Word says they were convicted. Okay, so they realize that. And then in verse 10, you know, it says, He lifted himself up and saw none but the woman and said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And you know, right there, there's one thing I really want you to really look at right here. There's three words right there, or four words right there that just absolutely astounded me when I, whenever they jumped off the page at me. Christ looked at her and says, Hath no man condemned thee? Think about that for just a minute. Have we got the right to condemn anybody? No. No man condemned thee. Man, whenever I saw that right there, I'll be honest with you, I got weak knees and sick in my stomach. Because I, I felt like God had just took me out from behind the woodshed and just thumped my gourd for me. Because I'm sitting here thinking, man, how many times have I done this? It's no. Yeah, I and mean, that's what we do. It's human nature for us to put ourselves in a different situation that makes us look better than that person. And that's, we all do it. I don't care who you are. Every one of us. Are, praise God. Whatever you are, we do it. Yeah, yeah, it's called self-preservation. Exactly. It's called self-preservation. You know, but no man condemned thee. And then in verse 11, Christ shows his grace. He shows his deity. He shows his authority in verse 11. He says, or she says, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, and right here's where he shows it. He shows it all right here in one sentence. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, sin no more is what I always think Well, it, it is, but you think about that for just a minute. That's right there where he showed his grace, his mercy. What I think it is, too, is he had died yet. Right? He hadn't killed no person. If they were all still under the law, so he had to tell her, sin no more. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. When he died, when they rose again, we fall under grace. Mm -hmm. So grace covers us today. Mm -hmm. From the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. Jesus will tell you the same thing today. He's not going to tell you to sin. Right. He's not going to tell you that we'll just sin sometimes. And he will tell you the same exact thing today. Do not sin. He just says sin no more. Right. Right. So he's doing the same thing he would do with her as he would with us today. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But I think right. That we're going to be perfect, but we know that His perfection covers it. That's right. That's why I always stuff here, but I always think, well, how would He give me a, a commandment that He knows I can fulfill and that He already knows in the future that I want to fulfill? Well, the only, the, really, now the only commandment He told us to do is love one another. Even though that you know that you can't reach that, I think that that is a go for us workforce to get better. That's right. Sound like that Holy Ghost. You hear this little voice in the back of your head going, "Don't do it." That small, still voice. Don't do it. You better listen to that. That small, still voice. Absolutely. But, and and that's called sanctification when we when we strive to not do that stuff no more, and and when we go to prayer. And, and we stay in prayer with God. We stay in that conversation with God. And, 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 and I'll just be honest with you. You know, as, a, as I read that right there and as, as, I, as I meditated on that story, man, I got beat down so many times. But at the same time, I got lifted up so much out of that message because I looked at Christ's humility during all that. But you think about it, man. He, he, he had a crowd of people around him. He was teaching anyway. And then these Sadducees and Pharisees and scribes and all these big folks bring this person to him. And you know what? I would have gotten offensive. I really would have because, I mean, I've been, you know. Huh. But he didn't. He just tumbled down like he never heard them and started writing on the dirt. And then just, it, 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 you know, the, there's no explanation or ex exclamation point behind his statement says, cast first on if you're without sin. There's no, it's like he said that calmly. He just looked up and said, well, the first one of you without sin, cast first on. And he just went back down to doing what he was doing. And it was his humility right there. And, you know. Well, the question was actually, well, the question originally was, let's see where we're at spiritually. Uh, I mean, what they asked him. What they asked him, well, they told him, you know, Moses said, and the law said, this is what, what we're supposed to do. What say you we do? So they're tempting him to step outside of the Mosaic law to show that he is more authority than the law does, so he would be committing blasphemy in their eyes to give them an excuse to snatch him up, take him, and. But didn't he go ahead and give him? He know him. They set him up with a lose lose situation, they thought. If he stoned him, he didn't stone the man. If he didn't stone him, he was against the law. But he didn't go against the law because he said, he, he built that law because he said, he was without him. So he passed the first time. Right. So he told him, stone him. Cast the first stone. You that's not God's seed, right? Because so he did what? Because none of us is a judge by the law, right? Right. Because we're breaking. But the law said that they had, she had to be stoned. He said, "Yeah." That's, the first that's what the law says. Yeah. They put him in what they thought was an impossible situation. You get out, and he got out. Because he used the very law that they tried to use on him. In the argument that. Uh, like you said, we don't know what he wrote in the sin. But you got to remember, Jesus was made under the law. And he had to fulfill the law. Or we had had a responsibility to be under the law. Right. And right. you see him preaching strong law. And sometimes you get confused reading the Gospels because you're like, well, man, what's Jesus talking about here? He is. Well, if you'll notice who he was preaching a strong law to, those that thought they were following. And, uh, so you use this technique in your life sometimes. Sometimes for somebody to get saved, they're going to get lost first. He was preaching law to the ones that thought they were following law to show them that they were following the law. And right. He had to do that many times, and that's why we were saying that he may have wrote the real law and saying to show them that they were wrong. Uh, but now I agree with you that it's nothing but grace. But when you see Jesus preaching law, he's preaching to those that thought they was fault to show them that they what? what? Therefore, fulfill the verse that the law is our schoolmaster. If you'll go back and look at every time, like Zeke said, every time he is preaching the law, Sadducees and Pharisees are all around him. Yeah. Every time. And they're supposed to be the ones that know the law better than anybody else. They have to be able to quote it verbatim by the time they're 13 years old. So, yeah, he's preaching the law to them. 
because they're supposed to be under the law. They're supposed to know the law better than anybody else. So the rest of the time, though, you see him preaching love and grace, don't you? Well, who's he preaching to? His followers and those that are just looking for him. Looking for him. So he's, he's, I think he gave a bit of both there. I think he gave a lot of both. And he fulfilled that law by saying, yeah, well, they passed, go ahead and stone because that's what the law calls for. Mm -hmm. And you and they got sin, you took their stone. And then he just waited. And when they walked off, then he mentioned the grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, he proved his deity. He proved his grace. He proved his mercy. He proved his love, his forgiveness. And the very last, very last line. And then, like you said, you know, he, he, he fulfilled the law. Because if you'll go back and really dig into Leviticus and, and Exodus and, and where all this law is wrote down. It even says further on down there that if there's a question about it, you take them to a priest. It says take them to the priest. But he knew before he said it, nobody was going to throw the first time. That's, right. That's exactly right, because he knew he was all sinners. That's the reason he's here. He already did it. He knew that he had come to fulfill the law. We were all sinners. We all fell short of the glory of God. I mean, none of us righteous. So, and, and that's, like I said, that's why that, that particular story come to heart tonight. And uh, it just, I, I felt like there was some points in there that we kind of all need to look at and we all kind of needed to say, all right, let's do a spiritual check. Where are we? Are we that stiff nosed Sadducees and Pharisees? Are we that adulterous woman or have we been both? That's the thing that, that, that people just need to realize is that this little sin is no different than this big sin. Amen. Well, there's no such thing as a little sin, big sin. There's no, so, so all we can do is try to help folks. All we do is try to help folks. Be it the way I help folks. I yell and scream do this, do that. That's the way I yeah. And that's the way I am. But my sin, if I cut J.D.'s throat, is no different than, than Trish taking an extra change that somebody gave her today. It's, People don't like, that's the thing that Jesus is trying to get across is, I'm here to help you through your mess. The best explanation. Of your mess, I promise you, Richie, I promise you, promise you all my heart, I'll help you through it. I'll, I'll help you through it. And all you got to do is give up at just that little old itty bitty mustard seed and have faith in what I tell you. And when you hear that little old quiet voice, and you, I don't care what you do, and you're paying, you're doing what? You're stirring your brain. You're a little quiet voice talk to you. Please, please, please. Amen. Because Amen. My sin is no greater than your sin. It, it's no, it's nothing. And the best way I'm trying I, to do is help you. The best and way. It uses me to yell at you, scream at you, or J.D. yell at you, scream at you. That's what, now we might be wrong doing that. But if you just listen to that little voice that comes in your head when everybody says nothing, then you're Sometimes we do the right thing the wrong way. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, as, as the best explanation I've, I've heard on the differences between sin was Zeke gets pulled over for running 57 and 55, and I get took in for murder. If God's sitting on the bench, you know, the judgment seat, Guess what both our penalty be if we don't have Christ's blood covering us? Amen. Eternity in hell. Amen. So don't condemn this one because they they do this or do that. That's it, right there. I just like God said the other day, you know, about little white lies. You know, I know that everybody's heard about little white lies. No such thing. Little white lies are just nasty big lies. Ain't they ain't no such thing as a little white lie. We just make ourselves feel better with saying little white lies. Like great big lies. I love you. I thank you for how you list. I thank you for how you participated tonight. Because, you know, I love to be able to, to, to hear people's thoughts, other believers' thoughts on God's Word. Because everybody gets a little bit different discernment when they read God's Word. I, I, I love how it come, up, come, come around. And, and I'm thankful that, that Brother Zeke stopped me halfway across the road and Said, hey, you got something in your heart tonight. So, you know, again, I don't believe in uh, uh, coincidences. God has a plan for everything. Amen. So, we're going to start a prayer. Yeah.